The only unbeaten heavyweight champion, Rocky Marciano, won the title from Jersey Joe Walcott with a right hand that many call the hardest single punch ever thrown. Muhammad Ali was still cash at play when he dazzled the world with a stunning upset of Sonny Liston. And after Ali, Larry Holmes was recognized as the legitimate champion. But in recent years, three different organizations, the World Boxing Association, the World Boxing Council, and the International Boxing Federation sanctioned championship fights, and each claimed that their man was the real title holder. One of the most prestigious titles in sports had been cheapened by a confusing series of unknown champions. The heavyweight division was a mess. Then two years ago, a young bull named Mike Tyson began an all-out assault that made him the youngest heavyweight champion ever and earned him the WBC and the WBA versions of the title. In 1985, the third title was taken from Larry Holmes by Michael Spink, first light heavyweight champion to win even a share of the heavyweight crown. The two Michaels, Tyson and Spink, were scheduled to settle matters with a unification fight last month. But Spink pulled out and was stripped of his title, leaving Mike Tyson to defend against former champion Fink Thompson. While Michael Spink took on Jerry Cooney last week before a sellout crowd in Atlantic City. Tonight, we'll talk with the winners. And for the first time on network television, you'll see both fights and examine the question, who is the heavyweight champion of the world? The heavyweight showdown, Michael Fink versus Jerry Cooney, the fight which took place June 15 in Atlantic City, and Mike Tyson versus Pinklin Thomas, May 30 in Las Vegas. This ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Mazda Cars and Trucks. The more you look, the more you like Mazda value. And by Kellogg's Products 19. Good evening, and welcome to Ringside at our ABC Sports studios in New York. I'm Jim Lampley, and tonight we're going to be examining perhaps the most intriguing question in boxing circles today. The question of who holds legitimate claim to the title of heavyweight champion of the world. In the ring tonight for this discussion are the two men who sit at the center of that question. On the right, Mike Tyson, current holder of the WBA and WBC versions of the heavyweight title, a man with a chance on August 1 to unify the championship in the eyes of all three existing governing bodies if he can defeat current IBF title holder Tony Tucker. And on the left, the man who twice defeated Larry Holmes, who was seen at the time as the legitimate heavyweight champion of the world, Michael Spinks, a man who, though stripped of that title by the International Boxing Federation, is still seen in many circles as the legitimate heavyweight champion. Also joining me for this discussion, in the ring, our ABC Sports boxing expert, Alex Wallow. And Alex, we're going to look first at Tyson Thomas. Indeed we are, Jim. As Mike Tyson has moved up the heavyweight ladder, we've seen evidence of a kind of split personality. And his first two world title fights were really dramatic evidence of his two extremes. In November of last year, he looked sensational when he went up against WBC champion Trevor Burbick, who chose to stand and fight with Michael and got bombed out early by the Tyson power. This was the victory that made Mike the youngest heavyweight champion in boxing history. Then in March, he looked lethargic against WBA champion James Bonecrusher Smith, who did nothing but grab and hold for 12 of the dullest rounds in heavyweight championship history. Mike fought just enough to win every round, but it was an embarrassing effort for a young man who says he feels an obligation not just to win, but to create excitement in the ring. And Mike, coming off the Smith performance, were you determined to look impressive against Thomas? Well, at that particular time, I felt like um, Mr. Smith didn't, do, didn't want to do anything but win. You know, after 12 rounds, and I knew Penguin Thomas came to win back his title, I felt very confident in his spectacular performance. Mike's opponent in his third title fight last month was Penguin Thomas, a man once considered the heir apparent to Larry Holmes as the dominant heavyweight in the world. He was unbeaten in 25 fights, when he stepped in against Tim Witherspoon in August of 1984 and used his outstanding left jab to dominate the fight and capture the title. Oh, 
Lincoln Thomas showed he had more than just a jab when he went against former champion Mike Weaver and destroyed Weaver with a single right hand. But the bright lights distracted Finklin Thomas, and he was very unimpressive in losing his WBC title in March of 86 to Trevor Burbick. It was that title that Mike Tyson won from Burbick, and it was that title, along with the WBA version of the heavyweight championship, that were on the line as Mike Tyson, unbeaten in 29 fights with 26 knockouts, defended against Finklin Thomas last month in Las Vegas. The third man in the ring, veteran referee Carlos Padilla. And right off the bat, Mike Tyson threw a power punch with the right hand, and right away, Finklin Thomas tied him up. And again, Thomas, making sure Tyson doesn't do any damage inside. Tyson, of course, had been frustrated in two previous bouts, the one immediately preceding this one when Bone Crusher Smith tied him up inside, locking his arms down, and Mitch Green had done it the year before in a bout in Madison Square Garden. Low right hand below Thomas' belt, and Mike Tyson was warned by referee Padilla. And certainly it appeared here in round one, Alex, after that good right-left combination, that Tyson was determined to get off to the kind of fast start he had exhibited in his title-winning two-round TKO of Trevor Burke. The important thing is he put punches together. There he, he tried a jab, missed it, tried another one, connected, and then came with another punch. And there, two good body punches. Mike Tyson has, is at his best. He is a devastating body punch. Good left hook. Driving Thomas back into the rope. And right after that left hook, when Thomas was on the rope, a right hand to the body, and then in combination, a left hook to the head. Pickle <laughs> Thomas tried to to fight back. He didn't run. He's not grabbing at this point. Maybe it's just that Tyson's just too active. He's just throwing too many punches. And too strong inside. And now just past the midway point of round one, the crowd at ringside began to anticipate a possible early knockout. And Thomas's legs appeared a bit wobbly. The biggest surprise of this round was the fact that Pinkler did not move more. Angelo Dundee, his trainer, said he was going to show Tyson a lot of lateral movement and confuse him. But here in round one, he just hasn't been able to do so. It was also interesting that he was unable to tie Tyson up inside and force him to stop punching, as had Smith and Green for long occasions. There, a devastating left hook. And again, Thomas backed up against the rope. Two tremendous punches inside, led by the uppercut. Mike Tyson at this point is really fighting left-handed. He's got his right foot forward. He's looking to load up that left hand. He just missed it there. Right uppercut inside. Thomas not holding on here. Perhaps two days to do so. So largely as a result of the effectiveness of the left hook used over and over again. Round one was a devastating and overpowering round for the champion, Mike Tyson. When I was 13 years old and he'd watch me box. The only thing I can remember him saying was that you're gonna be the youngest heavyweight champion in the world. Up, down, brown, drag out fights In this days and sleepless nights And one memory that still shines bright You were there for me I miss you, Clark. Round two, the round in which Mike Tyson had finished off Trevor Burbick after a similarly dominant round one to take away a title that Burbick had won from this same Pinklin Thomas six months before. So Mike missed two left hooks and then the right hand. A little bit of movement here from Pinklin to start of round two. And you had to suspect that Thomas's concerns entering round two would be number one to move and try to stay away from some of Tyson's heavy punches and two to begin to try to tie him up a little bit inside and the surprising thing here Mike was not as active on the inside as he could have been you see his hands are free there he did not let his hands go with the kind of powerful shots that he did in round one 
good Tyson jab. That's a jab that he shows all the time in the gym, but he has not yet been able to work into his, his fight plan in the ring. Good body punches again from Tyson. And this time, Thomas began to clinch and hold. But now, Pinklin Thomas was looking for his opportunities to throw the left jab. Not hard punches, but a little bit annoying, a little bit distracting for Tyson. And again, the two fighters laying on each other on the inside at the halfway mark in round two. In round one, Tyson would not have stood there and just pawed with his punches. He was ripping punches then. You heard Kevin Rooney's voice maybe in the background. Push him off, step back. It looked like Mike, the crowd beginning to boo. It looked like Mike was going to think about pushing back and a good isolated left hook. Early boos from the crowd in that brief period of inactivity, but of course, this was the scene of the disappointing Bone Crusher Smith bout. Tyson there seemed determined not to let it happen again. But at the end of that combination, he looked amateurish. His fight, his opponent was out of range, and Mike let go a, a wild right hand. Falling inside. Mike Tyson is not working his way in behind the jab or not letting his hands go. He kind of falls inside and does not let his hands go. And as round two came to a close, the fight had taken on an entirely different complexion than at the end of round one. It no longer appeared that Tyson was headed for an easy early knockout. Questions had arisen. Mike, what caused the change in your fighting style from round one when you're so aggressive and dominant to the latter stages of round two? Well, you see, after I exerted the engine in round one, I feel every time I hit him with a punch, I was able to hurt him. And then I, I wasn't concentrating. I just take him out. I knew any time I hit him, I can hurt him. And I wasn't really conscious of just going any amount of rounds. And I just knew eventually he would tire, as I saw in his last couple of fights, and I would catch him and he would go. Were you trying to pace yourself? Were you afraid of running out of gas? No, not at all. It's just that um, because I can box 15, 20 rounds, it's just that I was cautious of the heat and, you know, over expiring from the heat. So I just wanted to take my time and just trying to land a shot and get him out there and get him hurt and finish him. Well, the action stayed much the same in rounds three, four, and five. Mike doing enough to win on most of the judges' scorecards. Thomas Jab giving a little bit of trouble. We'll be back in a moment and pick up the action with round six. So as round six began, Tyson chased Pinklin Thomas to the ropes and was immediately grabbed for his trouble. Now the burden was falling on referee Carlos Padilla to be more active in controlling the bout. There, you saw Mike try to step back and get punching room, but he didn't let his hands go. It was a good idea, though. The kind of thing that Kevin Rooney urges Tyson to do. There are two good punches, both of the body. The body punches obviously do two things. They take the opponent's legs away, and they should create punching opportunities for the head. It was body punching which had established the tempo in round one when Tyson appeared to be close to knocking Thomas out. Now, he tried to take command of the bout with a similar assault. The right uppercut landed on Thomas's chin, and that turned the crowd's booing, which had just begun into cheers. Again, Kevin Rooney from the Tyson corner. Punch out, punch out. And there, the savage left hook. And that punch really was the beginning of the end. And now this flurry of blows 
dominated by the left hook. Three of them right there, putting Thomas on the canvas. Padilla finished the count. Angelo Dundee entered the ring to say that his fighter should take no more punishment. That was it. Mike, did that fight answer any questions you had about yourself? No, there was never no doubt. There never no doubts in my quality and capabilities and confidence in handling anyone in the world. It's just that I wanted to have a good, spectacular performance in this fight prior to the fight um, two, six weeks ago. Before that. And I was pretty satisfied. I put punches together, and I knew I had to take him out in the sixth round, and every punch was throwing bad intentions. And once I got him hurt, you know, he, he shouldn't even blink or twitch. And once I found out, I just put it all out, and that was it. Well, let's take a look back at the, the crucial punches in that sixth round that led to the first stoppage of Pinklin Thomas in his professional career. And right now, I'm sitting, I'm throwing my jab, and I'm going into my left where I'm going to throw the hook, because I knew he was going to drop his, hand, his right as soon as he jabs. And right there, he was in a tremendous amount of pain. You got underneath his jab uh, to throw that left hook. A lot of people said that his jab gave you trouble. Is that accurate? No, not at all. But as you know, he had the best left hand in the business. And he could give anyone problems, but I refused to be denied. And I, I saw I had him hurt. I just put everything together. And the punches he was taking was tremendous. Even though he seems like he's incoherent at the moment, he's was able to get away from some of the punches, but they were just coming in such a concession. Oh, and he was so brave, man. He took those punches. And he left the guy would probably stay down for the first left hook. The left hook was dominant in that flurry. Let's take a look at your right over uppercut here from the overhead view. As you see, the, the uppercut um, was effective, but it wasn't accurate enough. I just barely grazed them with the end of my, my thumb. Another angle on the sequence of punches that led to the stoppage. Do you have any criticisms of this performance at all, Mike? Anything you want to go back into the gym and try to learn? Well, not, not at all. You know, I let him feel comfortable that he can hold me. But which really, as you really put it to perspective, I could have got out of any one of his clinches. You know, he felt com comfortable, safe, so he stayed safe. Well, of course, an interested spectator here in the ring as we look back at that replay of Tyson Thomas. <clears throat> excuse me, is the man in the tuxedo with the bandage on his eye, Michael Fink. Your reaction to that fight, Michael? Well, I thought it was a, a good fight for Tyson, and uh, I still didn't understand why uh, the public was, was booing the way they were, but I think he displayed a very powerful performance. Now, as you look at a fight like that in your present state of affairs, do you look at it as purely an interested spectator or as a scout looking I, I, ahead? I look at it as an inter interesting spectator. All right, there'll be plenty of time to prepare for Mike Tyson when that fight comes up. And of course, when we come back right after this, we're going to get to the business of Michael Spinks and Jerry Cooney. We welcome you back to our ring in our ABC Sports studios in New York and prepare now to look back at the fight which was billed as the war at the shore. Michael Spinks versus Jerry Cooney. As he prepared for this fight, Michael Spinks was unbeaten in 27 fights as a light heavyweight and three as a heavyweight. Michael Spinks first entered the public eye as middleweight gold medalist at the 1976 Olympics, then won his first 15 pro fights before stepping into the ring in March 1981 against former light heavyweight champion Marvin Johnson. With one punch in the fourth round, he catapulted himself into a title shot against WBA light heavyweight champion Eddie Mustafa Muhammad. This was a grueling fight for the first 11 rounds, but a combination in round 12 dropped the champion, and Spinks went on to capture a unanimous decision and the title. He then scored KOs in his first five title defenses, but the match the public demanded and got took place in March of 1983 between Spinks and then WBC champion Dwight Muhammad Kawi. Here, he used reach, hand speed, and above all, an accurate left jab to unify the light heavy crown. Two years later, he moved up to challenge IBF heavyweight titleist Larry Holmes. And at the end of 15 chaotic rounds, Michael Spinks awaited the decision of the judges in Las Vegas. For the winner, by unanimous decision, and new IBF heavyweight champion of the world, Michael Spinks. 
become the first light heavyweight champion in history to move up and capture a heavyweight crown. After retaining the IBS title in a controversial rematch with home, Michael Scott's Norwegian Stefan Tankstead in the fourth round in his last fight, thus setting up the match with Jerry King. So Spinks arrived at June 15 with an 11-year pattern of unbroken success. And the same was true up to a point of Jerry Cooney. But Cooney's career has been an unusual one. In some ways, more graphically defined by his one loss than by his 28 victories. Jerry Cooney waded through his first 24 professional opponents with 20 knockouts before stepping in against former champion Ken Norton in May 1981. 54 brutal seconds into round one. It was all over for Norton. 13 months passed before the Mutt Valley Hoot battle between Cooney and WBC champion Larry Holmes. A fight in which Jerry started well, then seemed too preoccupied by the longer championship distance and didn't fight his fight. By the 13th round, an exhausted and battered Cooney was finished. He fell into a period of deep personal depression quit the ring, tried a short live comeback, then quit the ring again, citing personal problems, before finally coming back once more, May 1986, against the lightly regarded Eddie Gregg, and demonstrating, at least that at this level of competition, the old punching power was still there. The 86-second demolition of Gregg made Cooney a marketable contender again, though in five years, he had spent fewer than seven rounds in the ring without headgear, and none of that against a strong opponent. Mike, this was your fourth fight as a heavyweight, but your first against a man with a reputation as a big puncher. Did you prepare in any special way for this fight? Well, I did a few things different. Well, for one, I work with much taller men. And um, um, I, I train, I train for, for distance, in a sense. Do you have a set plan in mind that you work on in training, or do you wait till you get in the ring and react to your opponent? Well, I, if I need to look at films or, or watch anything in particular about a certain opponent, I will do. But for me, personally, I sum everything up in, in the ring. Jerry Cooney was a slight 7-5 to five favorite. Did you have any doubts about your ability to beat him when you heard the match was made? No. No, I just wanted to know how. That was my question. Now, how am I going to beat him? You know, I, I know of the way I would have to do it, but I mean, how in which ways is it going to happen? And it's fascinating that you would say that, Michael, because it was to be about, which would showcase Michael Spinks' remarkable improvisational talent, his resourcefulness, his ability to adjust in the ring. And we'll be back to look at all five rounds of Spinks and Cooney after this. Heavyweight Showdown is brought to you by Metaprint. When your body hasn't got time for the pain, Metaprint. And by Budweiser. Beachwood Aid for that clean, crisp taste. This bud for you. Eleven nights ago, a sold-out Atlantic City Convention Center with tickets ranging up to $500 stock. Scalpers lined up on the boardwalk outside and did business with a willing walk-up crowd. The assembled press corps brought full representation from both coasts. Liberal selection of celebrities dotted the crowd. Boxing champs Mike Tyson and Sugar Ray Leonard sat shoulder to shoulder. Legendary jockey Angel Cordero Jr. made the ride down from New York City. So did Donald Trump, financial backer of the fight. Up from Miami, Vinny Testaverde. So was Don Johnson. Arnold Lewis Cream known as Jersey Joe Walcott, spent a lot of time in Sphinx's camp. World Cruiserweight champ, Evander Holyfield at ringside. The scene was set. Alex Wallow and I prepared to call the fight. So to the music of Emerson, Lake, and Powell, Jerry Cooney enters. Jerry Cooney, a record of 28 wins and one loss. He is viewed as a paradox. Some see him as an awkward, unproven fighter who lost his one and only difficult match to Larry Holmes. Others call him a fighter of tremendous potential who might have been and may yet be a heavyweight champion. Which way do you see him, Alex? Jimmy could really be both of those things. I do think he's got tremendous potential, and if he can fulfill it at this 
at the age of 30 and beyond, he could still be a dominant heavyweight champion. The big key here is it's five years since Jerry got into the ring in the first big fight of his career against Larry Holmes that night in Las Vegas when he showed that he was a world-class fighter, but he just wasn't quite ready physically or mentally. And I think the real intrigue of this fight is how will this version of Jerry Cooney compare to the one that fought Holmes? What do you think? It, well, if he was a boxer, I wouldn't give him a real chance because of his lack of work in the last five years. But Jerry Cooney is a puncher, and that, that ring rust does not affect punchers as it does boxers. The reflexes and the timing and the overall skill are just not as critical to someone like Jerry who relies on his raw power. When last he fought in a spotlight this bright, he wore a full-length green robe decorated with shamrock. Tonight, the green is on white. Jerry Cooney returns to the limelight. And now also rose in white Michael Finkeron. Never beaten in 27 fights as a light heavyweight and three as a heavyweight. Like Cooney, he is seen as being awkward in the ring, Alex, but in his case is widely regarded as a virtue. Also possessed of ring intelligence, in fact, called by some the smartest fighter in the sport. The biggest question which surrounds Michael Fink. Is he really a heavyweight? Does he truly think of himself as one? Jim, you know, we have Goliath in the ring, and here comes David. Michael looks calm, but when we spoke to him earlier this week, he, he really openly admitted to us that he is very concerned about facing Jerry Cooney. He said, I'm worried about how I'm going to hit him. I'm worried about what's going to happen when he hits me. And he said, there's no way to prepare yourself to face a Jerry Cooney. So he's been a survivor for... 11 years since he's been fighting professionally and since his last amateur loss, he's always found a way to win every time he stepped in the ring. Obviously, Michael Spinks and everybody here wonders whether the tactics that he used to beat Larry Holmes not once but twice will work against a powerful giant like Jerry Cooney. So now, Spinks will step up into the ring and face the giant across 20 feet of campus. Alex, what do you expect to happen once the bell rings in round one. Jim, I think the biggest single factor in the fight, obviously, is Cooney's power. But in the home fight, Jerry was so preoccupied with his stamina and his ability to go the distance that he never really unloaded his power and took the initiative. Jerry says he learned his lesson from that fight. He'll jump on Michael from the opening bell. If Jerry Cooney can plant his feet, wind up, and hit Michael's face, this fight is over. Michael must keep Jerry off balance. He must not let him get set. He's got to frustrate him. He's got to tire him. And he's got to hope that Jerry will fade just the way he did against Larry Holmes. But he also has to pick his spots, and he's got to generate some offense to keep Jerry from walking in without any fear. All right, Alex, the tale of the tape shows that both fighters are 30 years old. Cooney out, Wade Fink at the weigh-in by 30 pounds. The scale was regarded by many as being three or four pounds heavy. Let's say Fink is at least 205 and Cooney at least 234. Height, a five inch difference in Cooney's favor. Reach, a similar dissimilarity again in Cooney's favor. And now ring announcer Ed Darian prepares to begin the festivity. In the ring at this time, the man in charge of this scheduled 15 round title bout, referee Frank Cap. Puccino. And now, boxing fans, introducing the principal. First, in the blue corner, wearing the white trunks with the green and gold trim. He tipped in at an even 238 pounds. This gentleman has 28 wins, one loss with 24 knockouts. From Huntington, Rhode Island, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the challenger, gentlemen, Jerry Cooney. Cooney. And here is the home run car, wearing the long run, wearing the black train. He weighed in at even 280 pounds. This young man is unprecedented in very professional bouts with a 20 knockout. He is the 1976 Olympic gold medalist in the middleweight division. 
champion, the former undisputed light heavyweight champion of the world, a man from St. Louis, Missouri. And now, we finally get a great medal of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Now, referee Frank Cappuccino will issue final instructions to the fighters about not sanctioned as a title fight by any of the three world governing bodies, but supposedly recognized for title purposes by a variety of state athletic commissions. The rules used here in the state of New Jersey, the fight is scheduled for 15 rounds, scoring on the 10-point must system by three judges, referee Frank Cappuccino doesn't score. No three knockdown rule, no standing eight count. There will be a mandatory eight count on knockdown. And round one begins. Cooney with the first few issues, three jabs. See the brace on Michael Spink's right knee. That is something we've seen in fights before. It was a knee injury that kept him out of boxing earlier in his career. It's just prevented if he says there's nothing wrong with the knee, but he wants to make sure nothing happens. Michael Spink, historically a slow starter, particularly in the second fight against Larry Holmes when he lost the first four rounds. Cooney, on the other hand, starts fast. He generally starts fast, as judged by his record, except in the Holmes fight when he paced himself. But it be interesting to see if he jumps right on Michael. He has contended ever since the Holmes fight that it was a mistake to pace himself, and he would not do it again. You see right off that Michael is not running away, as many people expected him to do. He's moving his head. He's not giving him a set target, but he's not running. He's not on his bicycle. And there he's getting off a good two-punch combination generating that offense that we talked about. You have to give Jerry something to think about. You can't just let him walk in. Thinks his trainer, Eddie Foote, has intimated to many that relieve Cooney can easily be hit with the right hand. Thinks has already landed to right cross. He just landed a low blow, that left hook blow that he landed so many times against Larry Holmes. I didn't hear a warning from the referee. Good right hand by Michael Spink. And indeed, it does appear in this round that Cooney is vulnerable to the Fink's overhand right. Traditionally, the best weapon in his arsenal. And traditionally, the best punch to throw against the left hooker. The overhand right against the left hook, countering the left hook. So far, it has been Cooney's jab against Fink's right hand. Under a minute to go in round one. Another scoring left hand by Michael. The uppercut is something Cooney has used increasingly in recent bouts. Came back with a left and a right. Two left hooks. One land and one miss. That first combination seemed to bother Michael a little bit. Comes back with a good stiff jab of his own. And another one. Chris, precise jab by Spink. Coming back with the right. Ten seconds to go in the round. Both fighters have done some damage. Every time he jabs, you, you're going to block that jab. When you jab, expect him to go down. To be ready to go down with a double hook in the body and a hook to the All right? Don't let him take the play with you. Take your time. Take your time. Keep the plate. Keep the plate. Take close and be ready to go down all the time. Tick tock all the time. Tick tock. Nice and cool. Keep your elbows close to your body. Don't get over top. Keep your hands. Watch the right hand. Advice between rounds one and two from Cooney's trainer, Victor Valley, sometimes seen as his second father. Round 
two begins. Round one would appear to have been won by Michael Spink, at least to these observers. I thought Michael boxed an outstanding first round, did just what he has to do. Kept Jerry off balance with movement and with punches of his own. Left There's hook. Left hook and a right behind it by Cooney. Moved Michael a few feet across the ring. And you see more movement from Michael now. A little bit more respect for Cooney. He didn't land any of those punches. Not as solid with the right as he was in the first round. Good jab. Right hand to the body. Cooney's right hand is not a big part of his arsenal, but he does throw it well to the body. And that could take away some of Michael Spinks' movement. And Spinks increasingly is standing still now again in this round, making himself available to Cooney's left hand. Another good jab. He keeps getting that jab in between Jerry Cooney's hands. He's been very accurate with his punches so far. Jerry just scored a punch of his own, but then took another Michael Spinks jab in his face. And already there is reddening around the nose of Cooney. Another terrific left hand by Michael Spinks and another. Those jabs are doing two things. One, they're scoring points, and two, they're keeping Jerry Cooney from getting set and letting his own hands go. Indeed, Cooney is not moving forward nearly as assertively as he did at the beginning of the fight or even at the beginning of this round. Again, the big jab gets home. Michael standing much more flat-footed now and doing getting the better of the scoring. One minute to go in round two. This has been an unusually fast start for Michael Fink. And a terrific right hand. It will take an accumulation of blows for Fink to be able to hurt Cooney. But he has indeed gained the respect that you mentioned a few moments ago, Alex. You saw Jerry Cooney look over at his corner just then to Victor Valley. That may be a little bit frustration. Looking for a, some help in the corner and solving the problems that Spinks is presenting to him right now. And indeed, one thing that most Spinks supporters expected would, was that he would be able to get inside Cooney's head and cause his self-confidence to erode. Another good combination inside by Spinks. And nothing coming back from Jerry Cooney. He's allowing Michael to get in there, score those punches, and he's not giving anything back. The first two rounds Terrific. belong to Michael Spinks. Terrific two-punch combination and a left. Long-lasting Old Spice, stick deodorant and solid antiperspirant. All I could say, all I could remember, get this guy out of the way and the way it will be paid for it. I didn't think Clay won the fight, the second fight. Not at all. The fight in Manila, uh, my eyes were closed. I didn't, I couldn't continue. Then I think he, he won that but no question. I'd like to have one more fight. Just one more. Take a look at some action here at the end of round two. Michael Spink followed that jab in with his head to get inside, score heavily there to Cooney. Their heads are very, very close. And it's apparent here at the end of round two that when their heads met that Michael Spink got accidentally butted and cut, as you see by his disgusted reaction. And now, cut man Percy Richardson goes to work in Spinks' corner. There you can see it, right on the eyebrow, very close to the bridge of the nose. Michael Spinks with something brand new to worry about as they get ready for the bell in the beginning of round three. It would be interesting to see if Michael fights differently trying to protect that eye. Interesting, he's already begun pawing at it with the right glove. You saw him do so before he left the corner. Now we'll watch to see if Cooney will go after that cut. Again, Spinks feeding Cooney to the punch. They both threw left and Michael got home. What blood has begun to trickle from the cut above Spinks' eye? And you, and you can see him pawing at it with the glove. It's bothering him, and Jerry Cooney's got a target to shoot for with that left jab. And he's going after it.
becoming the aggressor in the fight. Startling, really, when you consider all the pre-fight speculation that he would merely try to stay away in the early rounds. Cooney has to move, try to cut off the ring, and meanwhile, he's not throwing any punches. There's Michael Spinks, take a little time off the clock, stalling. Alex, you suggested before the fight that ring rust does not hurt a puncher, but one area in which it can be critical is defense. And Cooney seems short on reflexes to avoid Spinks' punches. Well, defense was never Jerry Strong's suit. His, his defense is his offense and he just is not letting his hands go now and that is a function of the ring rush he doesn't have his rhythm and he's not allowing he's not getting set because of michael's movement and michael's offense one minute to go in round three now jerry coming on a little bit and Michael, when he hesitated, Michael drilled him with his own. Alright, get him loose, get him loose. Finks is showing remarkable loose. courage going in at Cooney and using his quickness to beat him to the punch. Him. His instincts are so good, Michael. He says, I, I'm going to go out there and see what he's got and then I'm going to do what I have to do to win. And that's what he's doing. He went out, he saw he could go in there, get off his own punches and not take punches in retaliation. That does not mean he's won the fight, however. Jerry Cooney is a ticking time bomb. Michael Spinks can win round after round and make just one mistake and be on the seat of his pants and in desperate trouble. But again, here in round three, he has landed to this point with 15 seconds to go in the round. Far and away, the more effective punches and the greater number. Cooney, though, just came with the left hook. And the second half of this round was a better round for Jerry Cooney. Book. We again watch the work of Percy Richardson in Michael Spinks' corner as they attend to the cut above Spinks' right eye. Take a look here at some action from round three. Very good. He bends down and throws left hook. He hesitates, and when he hesitates, he is lost. Michael Spinks lands his own left and then moves out of range. Action typical of the fight thus far. Round four begins in Atlantic City. To this point, Michael Fink has had the better of all of the first three rounds with the use of his left jab, overhand right, the quick left hook inside. Cooney has landed some damaging blows, but not enough to score with Fink. Jerry is not cutting the ring off. He's following Michael around. Just not letting his hands go. It's as simple as that. Cooney doubling and tripling with the left hook. And I think those lefts took a little something out of Michael. He's fighting back. But it's possible that the heavy hands of Jerry Cooney. He just looked down at the uh, photographers and told him to step back. He must have stepped on one of the photographers on his way, back, way by there. Two more good left from Cooney. It looks like Jerry Cooney is starting to get the rain. And Spinks has begun to back up once again. Not coming forward now as he did in rounds two and three. Warning to both fighters and the referee, Frank Cappuccino, you've got to stop holding. Cooney there able to block the right with his left hand. Earlier, he did not seem capable of doing that. Left hand from Spinks, who is sniping more now, hitting and moving away. Much less active round for Michael. With a little more than a minute left in this round, he really hasn't scored a, a good clean blow. For the first time in the fight, Jerry Cooney is dictating the pace.
heave this is around with good Bill Cooney's confidence. Crowd beginning to well up behind him a little. Move of him! Move of him! Inside uppercut. Mike Cooney didn't land clean. Good left hook. There's Michael in the corner. Moves away. He wants to use all the ring and never feel the ropes on his back, Michael thinks. There he is scoring one good punch inside. Beating Cooney to the punch inside. We're not really scoring much there, Jim. Good right to the body by Cooney. By Spinks, I'm sorry. And round four has been, for the first time, Cooney's round. I don't tell you what to do with your fire. Do I? Round five. Jerry Cooney will try to continue the momentum he gained in the last round. Fink exits his corner with two stiff jabs. And another. That's the jab Michael didn't throw in round four. Scored two quick ones here in round five. And a third. Thinks the aggressor returns. Cooney retaliates with one left hook inside. Michael Stinks told us before the fight, there's four ways to avoid a roadblock. You can go around either side, you go over or under. But sometimes you just have to go right through it. And he is smart enough to know that he has to fight Jerry Cooney. He just can't run. The key is how well he picks his spot. Cooney backing up. A 15-round fight evolves in chapters. But for the moment, it would appear that Michael Spinks has been immaculately prepared and very well prepared for this assignment. It's hard to believe that what many people consider to be a blown up light heavyweight like Michael Spinks could back up Jerry Cooney, which he has done here in the first half of round five. Good right hand by Spinks. And Cooney is well. hurt. Cooney is hurt. Cooney, Spinks. much as he was against Holmes, can't defend himself. Cappuccino will start the count. Five, six, seven, eight. You all right, man? He is not all right. He's desperate. And this fight could very well be stopped if Michael could continue this pace. Cody is not throwing at all. No three knockdown rule in effect. Five, six, seven, eight. You all right? You know who I am? Huh? Okay. This fight is over. Jerry Cooney cannot defend himself. He doesn't know how to grab. He's not holding on at all. He's not fighting back. He's just taking punches. There's one punch of retaliation. Spinks has to collect himself. He backs off, and Cooney walks right to him. Spinks may be arm-weary. But Cooney can't stop it. And this and is it. That's all, Jerry. That's all, Jerry. Taking too many shots, Jerry. Tremendous heart, 
tremendous rig intelligence and an awful lot of guts on the part of Michael Spinks. And a fight which, because of legal entanglements, jurisdictional disputes, personal acrimony, seemed for so long, so unlikely, finally takes place and ends with the most unlikely result. An early knockout by Michael Spinks of Jerry Cooney. Official time, two minutes, 51 seconds of the fifth round. Referee Frank Cappuccino decrees that this fight cannot go on. Cooney helpless in his own corner. He never really lost consciousness, Jerry Cooney, but he was just taking too many clean punches. The referee did absolutely the right thing to stop it. Here, Alex, the first knockdown. Michael Spinks took off round four, but he came out in round five, used a jab, and then power punches with both hands. Right on the inside, Cooney had no punching room at all. And you see Michael just landing punch after punch. Cooney trying to back off to get some room to breathe. Spinks right in his face, very accurate punches. Wasted very few punches in putting down Jerry Cooney there. Let's take a look at knockdown number two. You see Jerry Cooney's face on the receiving end. Again, Spinks right inside. Cooney completely unable to tie him up, to get by himself any time. Not getting any punches off the zone, just taking punches. The overhand right on the temple area. Michael Spinks and Eddie Punch said they could hurt Jerry Cooney to the temple, and Cooney went down again. And let's take a look here at the final stoppage of the fight. Cooney on the ropes trying to defend himself, but Spinks' accuracy just going through whatever defense Jerry Cooney was able to put up. And there's Frank Cappuccino stepping in and saying it's all over. So there it was. Eleven nights later, a look back at Michael Spinks' nearly flawless performance in his five-round David and Goliath TKO of Jerry Cooney in Atlantic City. It had been our hope that Jerry Cooney would also be here with us to look back at that fight. That isn't the case. Jerry was offered an opportunity to appear on this program and declined to appear. So let's take a look back now at what Jerry had to say to Alex Wallow in the ring right after the fight. Jerry, what happened? I just felt tight and I never got going. I never got uh, the fluid movement for some reason. I don't know why. Were you shocked that he came out and traded with you and threw so many punches at you? I just didn't get going. I never got going in the fight. Uh, all the credit to the world to him. Uh, he did very well tonight. This is a break. Jerry, did your inactivity hurt you? Did you feel that that's the reason you couldn't get off no, while you were tight? I just never got moving. I should have uh, warmed up a little more. Whatever the reason is, uh, I didn't get going and uh, turned out the way it did. Jerry, following the loss to Larry Holmes five years ago, you left the ring for, for over two years. It took you a long time to get back in. Do you think you'll continue your fighting career now? I'll, I'll take some time out and think about it, and uh, we'll talk again. Thank you, Jerry. In the week and a half since that fight took place, there have been reports of a falling out between Jerry Cooney and his management. Specifically, it has been written that Cooney has not spoken with manager Dennis Rappaport since the loss to Spinks. Our attempts to reach Rappaport have not met with success, so no further light can be shed on that subject at this time. When we come back, Alex Wallow will discuss the fight with Michael Spinks. The center of the ring in our ABC Sports studio in New York. I'm Jim Lampley along with Mike Tyson, Michael Spinks, and Alex Wallow. And Alex, a chance now to talk over Cooney Spinks with the winner. Michael, this is the first opportunity you've had to see a replay of the fight. In the weeks before the fight, did you ever believe you could score such a sensational knockout? No, I didn't uh, see how I was gonna do it, but I, I did believe that uh, things were possible to happen. You're normally a slow starter, but you dominated Jerry Cooney almost right from the opening bell. Uh, did you think that you could come out right away and score such heavy punches? Well, I disagree with the slow starter part. <laughs> that's what the, that's the rumors, but um, uh, I did. I was very effective in the gym against my taller men, so I thought that I could possibly score very well against Jerry Cooney. Once uh, things came down to a certain pace, because Jerry gives you a lot, and I, all I had to do was uh, throw the right punches, and I would connect. You still have stitches over your right eye. How much did that cut bother you during the fight? Well, it, it bothered me very much because, I mean, in a sense, uh, because of Jerry, uh, Jerry's previous fights, every last one, he had, he had each and every opponent bleeding like, I mean, like a hog. So I said that I didn't want to suffer from these type of uh, things uh, 
damages that could possibly end the fight. So when I noticed that I had collided heads with him and I felt a burning sensation, I knew it was a cut. And I checked it as I went back to the corner, sounded the bell, and it kind of, you know, got to me. I said, uh, so I knew I had something else to deal with. And the reaction from my corner man, I told, it told me that it was a, pr a pretty bad cut. But uh, knowing that he was uh, good at his trade, I uh, felt confident in, in dealing with it. Well, let's take a look at uh, action from the decisive round, perhaps in your long career, the most single sensational round that you've ever fought. Midway here in round five. Okay, I was steady moving, lateral movement, and uh, I saw that I could uh, stand with Jay for a certain amount of time. And the more I punched, the more he seemed to have uh, got on the, on the defense. Did he ever so, hurt you? Uh, some quick punches. I think in the earlier round, he threw a, threw a quick right hand off his left, left hook, and it, it surprised me. You had coasted a little bit in round four. Did you sense that you could come out here and, and take him out here in round five? Well, not at all. I, I just, um, I think what the coasting did for me was give me uh, a large burst of energy. And he, there you saw a large burst of energy that put Jerry Cooney down. Were you surprised that he got up, Michael? No, no. I, I, I always, I, I look for things to happen like that for myself, but it never happens. So I look forward to everybody getting up, giving me the fight that I'm used to getting. And he goes down again there. It looked almost like he was looking for a place to get some rest. I, I mean, as easy as he, was, as he was going down, I guess it's not easy. I mean, it took a, a great deal of punches to put him down. I thought that, uh, well, he would relax for a while before he would get up, make any attempt to get up. So I said, well, I know he's probably going to recover, and it would go another round. I, ne I never knew how many seconds I ticked away. Coming up right here, he lands one single left hook on you that backs you up. Did this punch hurt you? Right? No, not at all. It, there. I was surprised that he hit the... Yeah. You know, like I said, I, I thought he would recover, and I, and I thought after beating him so much, normally you beat a guy out of it and back into it. So I thought I had actually done that to Jerry, beat him out of it and back into it. And I thought he had recovered, so I said, well, let me, let me see, let me look at him. I looked at him and see if, to see if he had recovered totally. But so he was still kind of drooped over, so I said, let me go ahead. Go You've beaten in. Larry Holmes twice. You've now beaten a, a Jerry Cooney that was favored. Do you think people will now give you your due as a legitimate heavyweight? Honestly, I don't really care. I don't even, and if they don't, I don't want it. You know, I, I am who I am. I do what I do the best I can do it, and, and I'm satisfied. Well, Michael, as you noted on the videotape, this man, Mike Tyson, was at ringside that night and now has seen the bout again on videotape. Your reaction to Spinks' performance? You no, know, Jim, I, I was impressed. I was totally impressed. I just, I, I never expected that from him. It was just tremendous the way he display the accuracy, he used his experience, he used his wildliness, he discouraged him, he frustrated him, and he played into his game. And you see the, the result of the foregone conclusion. Pretty good right cross, too, huh? Unbelievable. Very impressive. All right, when we come back, we're going to sum up the entire question of who deserves to be called the legitimate heavyweight champion of the world. That'll be right after this. are two primary schools of thought with regard to how a man gains recognition as a boxing champion. One has to do with the three self-appointed governing bodies which are now in the business of sanctioning championship fights. The so-called alphabet groups, the WBA, the WBC, and the IBF. All three have evolved within the past 25 years in response to commercial, political, and organizational conflicts within the sport. They seldom agree on a unified champion in any weight class and have not been in sync on a heavyweight champ since the WBC stripped undisputed title holder Leon Spinks in 1978. But as a result of the elimination contests in which he has already won two championship belts, Mike Tyson now has a chance to unify the heavyweight crown in the eyes of those sanctioning bodies by defeating the IBF title holder Tony Tucker on August 1. Tucker won that title, stripped from Michael Spinks, in an elimination bout TKO of Buster Douglas last month. But there's another important force in boxing, in some ways more powerful than the alphabet groups. And that force is ring tradition. 
Since the days of John L. Sullivan, a part of the mystique of a boxing championship is that it must be won or lost in the ring. The heavyweight title has a lineage which can be traced through the past century from Sullivan on up to Larry Holmes. And the man who defeated Larry Holmes in the ring, not once but twice, was Michael Spinks. So by the standard of tradition, it is Spinks who is heavyweight champ until he loses to another man. The Ring Magazine, founded in 1922, regards itself as a custodian of boxing tradition. It is in keeping with that philosophy that the Ring continues to recognize Michael Spinks as its heavyweight champion. We at ABC Sports conducted two ad hoc samplings of public opinion among various groups to determine what people think about this. First among boxing people and writers, those who work within the sport. In my opinion, it's still Mike Tyson because, as far as I can see, Michael Spinks allowed his title to be stripped so as not to fight Tyson. Mike Tyson, it's obvious to the whole world he's the heavyweight champ. He's got the belts to prove it. Michael Spinks is the genuine, no naga hide, 100% heavyweight champion of the world because he won the title from Larry Holmes. On balance, I think Mike Tyson's overall record and his, the way, the spectacular way in which he's won all these fights makes him the champion. Well, I don't know about legitimate in this world of uh, boxing. Uh, who's to say what's legitimate? I just think Tyson's the better fighter right now, that's all. I think that uh, there are two legitimate claims by Michael Tyson and Michael Spinks. They both have good reason to claim the title, and it won't be settled until they meet. Now, what about the man on the street here in the United States? What does the average American boxing fan think of the question of who should be recognized as the true heavyweight champ? Well, uh, I would say Tyson is the champion of the world. And Tyson's the only champ. He's a beast. He'll beat anybody. I believe myself that Mike Speaks is the heavyweight champion of the world right now until Mike Tyson beat him, and when they fight, speaks to beat him. Mike Tyson is only because he's got iron in his gloves. I think Michael Spinks is the heavyweight champ legally, and uh, I think when he fights Mike Tyson, uh, Tyson will then become the, uh, the world champ. Mike Tyson? Yeah, Mike Tyson. He can beat anybody around. Michael Spinks. The reason I think it's Michael Spinks is because he won it from the champion. Michael Tyson. Without a doubt. No, Michael, Michael Spinks because Spinks. he beat Larry Holmes. Mike Tyson, without a doubt. No question about it. Or Rick Wisniewski. <laughs> One more group. The man on the street overseas because it is, after all, not just an American championship, but a world championship. Here's how people in other countries answered our question about the heavyweight champ. Hey, the Benji Massimi. The Benji Massimi and Mike Tyson. Uh, Mr. Tyson. Spike. Maybe. Pink. Pink, maybe. Uh, so, Genji Tyson is Mike Tyson. Tyson is the most important thing. Tyson. And why do you say Well, uh, I don't know uh, any boxers besides Tyson. Well, Mike Tyson. I heard that there was such a guy, Ali. Aha. Uh -huh. Ali. I'm not sure about it, but I think he is Mike Tyson, Mike, uh, Tyson now. In box is uh, Michael Spinks. Uh, my, can you come here? My, Mike Tyson, and because he's the best. Mike Tyson, isn't it? It's got to be. Uh, Mike Tyson? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Who's your weight champion? Mike Tyson, of course, young man. Boxing? Yeah. No, my yeah. husband do. I'm a new cut. It was our intention in those little montages to accurately reflect the range of opinion we encountered on the street. Interesting to note that here in the United States there was quite a mixture of opinion, though Tyson was favored by about a two-to-one margin. Overseas, for whatever reason, it was almost unanimous for Tyson. And in the man-on-the-street interviews, not those with inside boxing people, nobody picked the current IBF world champion, Tony Tucker. A chance now for these two gentlemen to each in turn stake their claims to the title. Michael Spinks. Why should you be seen as the heavyweight champ? Well, for reasons of, uh, say, history as it was shown, um, as it was traced back to uh, John L. Sullivan. Um, crowns only won and lost in the ring. And those are my reasons why I still should be considered the heavyweight champion. And Mike Tyson, what's your argument against that? Well, I feel, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that he's a great fighter and he deserves the right to be champion and titles are won and lost in the ring, but they've been never given up. They won and lost, nobody never 
gave the title up. I think that was a bad idea, but he feels that he's champion. I feel that I'm champion. Perhaps someday in the future we can get together and we can squash it. Well, that, of course, is what the boxing public looks forward to, a final settlement in the ring. And when we come back, we'll discuss the future of the heavyweight division and the question of when Michael Spinks and Mike Tyson might meet again inside a boxing ring with bad intentions. The last time in our ABC Sports ring in New York to reflect again on the question that began the evening, who deserves to be recognized as the legitimate heavyweight champion of the world? Quite obviously, barring catastrophe, these two men, Mike Tyson and Michael Spinks, will someday meet in a ring to settle the issue once and for all. And with an eye toward that, we ask the two men who will hold the answers to the questions of where and when that bout will take place for their observation. First, Jim Jacobs, co-manager along with Bill Caton of Mike Tyson. Second, promoter Butch Lewis. We tried desperately to get Michael Spinks to fight Mike Tyson. Did everything humanly possible to get Michael Spinks to fight our, our champion. We were unsuccessful. I even testified in court to try to force Michael Spinks into the ring against Mike Tyson. They actually forced us out of the series. But now, to settle it, we're willing to come to the table right away and settle all that. We're not running away. We're not ducking. Please hear my, my plea. We want some Tyson in the ring now. Now, Michael Spinks has beaten Jerry Koenig, and he wants Bill and I to do an opposite turn. All of a sudden, we are supposed to ignore our contractual commitments, ignore our verbal commitments, all of which will make the heavyweight champion, Mike Tyson, enormously wealthy, and we're simply not going to do it. These commitments, these so-called commitments, can certainly be put on hold for a period of 90 days. I spoke with Jacobs and Kate. The commitments are commitments with, that don't even carry fighter names. Well, who are you fighting? Don't know yet. Well, then, why don't you just pencil Michael Spinks in? We've made the plans for a year. We're going to proceed with our plans. We're going to ignore the Michael Spinks Jerry Cooney fight. And at some time in the future, if there's a reason to sit down, after we have fulfilled all of our commitments, we'll sit down. There now, one final look at two great heavyweight fighters sitting together. Alex Wallow, your turn. Well, first for Michael Spinks. Michael, there are those who say that you pulled out of the fight with Mike Tyson because you're afraid of him. How do you react to that? Well, I would say that's a falsehood. It's a very untrue. And um, it's make-believe. I've never been afraid of anybody. And I think uh, there's no time now to start. And for Mike Tyson, you follow boxing history. Is it possible for you to feel that you are the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world until you beat this man in the ring. Well, it's not as if Michael's retired or anything and I'm in his shadow, you know, and if we go by history terms, perhaps someday in the future we can get together, you know what I mean? I don't know what goes on with the management. I hear he reneged that chance to fight me. But until then, I'm going to still get rewarded greatly, even if people don't think so, pretending I'm the you know, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. A few final thoughts. I think the question will remain open and discussed until the two men meet in the ring. But until that time, all of this controversy and all of the questions are very good for the heavyweight division. And Jim, what's good for the heavyweight division is very good for the sport of boxing. Indeed it is, Alex. And ABC Sports' coverage of boxing will continue, incidentally, tomorrow at 3 o'clock Eastern Time when we bring you live coverage of the IBF Junior Middleweight Championship fight from Montreal between champion Buster Drayton and challenger Matthew Hilton as ABC Sports presents Schlitz Malt Liquor Professional Boxing. Until then, for Alex Wallow, so long and thanks for being with us.